Well, hey, friends, welcome back to another episode of The Therapy Show. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard, and this week's guest is Alexandra Wyman. Welcome to the show, Alexandra. It's so great to meet you. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I'm just so honored to be here, and I'm excited for our conversation today. Yeah, so will you um, tell our listeners you know, a little bit about who you are and um, maybe kind of what you're here to talk about today? I'd like, I'll let you introduce it. Oh, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm actually, um, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist by trade. So Mm -hmm. I work uh, mostly in early intervention, which is ages zero to three. And I have a three and a half year old myself and we live in Colorado. And the reason why I'm here today is because in August of 2020, my husband died by suicide and there were no signs, didn't see it coming worst day of my life. Um, we had been married. It was four days before our second wedding anniversary. And we were just making plans. Obviously we were in the midst of COVID. We were just making plans for some diving trips and travel. And then this happened and, um, grief is complicated anyway. And then grief by suicide is even more complicated. I would say just because there are so many, you don't see it coming. There are so many questions that go unanswered. And I found I was, I was gifted some really beautiful journals and I was encouraged in prayer and spirituality, but I didn't really have any resource for how do you handle the day to day? How do you start healing? How do you even take a step forward? Um, And my situation was complicated by the grief of others, which is very common. And so I decided to write a book about my healing process and I was very fortunate. I was able to actually publish it. It's been such a, such a road to get there, but a big part of it and this scenario and in, in my experience has been really getting an up close and personal look at the stigma and judgment around suicide and those who die that way and really wanting an opportunity to help people maybe shift their mindset a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Wow. I mean, what a, you know, I'm always, I'm, I'm, we're not always, I'm definitely, definitely moved by my guests that I bring on the show, but when you reached out and, you know, I was reading about your story and I saw your website and and all the things that you've been through and that you're doing, I was like, heck yeah, you've got to come on this show and, and talk about this. Um, you know, cause most of my listeners are therapists. And so in therapy, a lot of the times we are helping our clients or patients, you know, move through the grieving process and everybody goes through it differently. And grief is not a linear process at all. So not that I can imagine what you went through because I can't, um, but tell us a little bit about the different, maybe, can you take us through a little bit of the stages of grief that you, that you can, you can pinpoint for us? Yeah. So I, I like to say that, that all those, like those stages of grief, they're, they're kind of a hot mess of emotion (laughs) and they can come at any point in time sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes all together. Um, very early on, I had someone tell me that this process would be like you're on a surfboard in the ocean. And she was like, sometimes it's going to be really calm. Sometimes you're going to be in a squall, but whatever you do, just hold on to that surfboard. And the surfboard for me was my son. So I do encourage people going through this process of find, even if it's one little bit, find something that you can hold on to, to give you a little bit of that hope because individuals who are impacted so closely by suicide, do have a higher chance of dying that way? And so being able to have something to latch on to, but it's, it's a roller coaster of emotion and it is so hard in that grief process. And I love that you're acknowledging that everyone is different, Mm -hmm. how we do it. Um, my, for me in particular, my anger was less toward my husband and more towards my situation, my new situation. And then some of the ways that people had approached me after his death, um, which is very different. Cause I know people who were very close to my husband who, you know, their anger is at him. <laughs> so it just kind of transpires differently. And, and again, you could have it all. I mean, in a two minute span, I could, I could be dealing with my anger. I could be crying out of sadness. I could be in that denial, um, area of like, Oh my gosh, is this really happening? Did this, like, he's just at work and he's going to walk through that door any moment. And it, and it seems so, so irrational and erratic, but that's, that is how, yeah, how it is. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very tumultuous. Sure. Sure. So I know we want to talk about your book and I want to ask a couple questions about your son, but 
did you did you go to therapy after oh. the, the death okay Yes. I'm a big fan of having a, t I say it's my toolbox and I'm a big fan of having, finding what your tools are. They're going to change on a daily basis. So you never know what's going to fit or work, but have them. Mm -hmm. And I also encourage people to start working on the habits around these tools. When you're feeling good, we tend to not do that. We tend to wait until we aren't feeling well, or we're a little depressed or, mm -hmm. you know, some life event happens. And then we start seeking out our tools and trying to figure it out. And I, I feel like it's a little bit more manageable when, when you're doing that, when you're healthy, like not healthy, excuse me, when you're feeling right. a little bit better. So, right. you know, if you're going to be, if exercise is a thing, get in the habit of exercise, journaling, get in the habit. But I did. Yes. I have a grief therapist that I still work with now. I was working with someone who does thought field therapy, which in, incorporates, um, tapping, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I have, um, I'm trying to think, cause I feel like I had, I did have one through my work. I had a therapist through my work that I also was consulting for a while. Um, so I, and, and they all have different roles, mm. which has been very helpful. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you, you sought out support from a lot of different types of therapists, which is cool. Was that, so did one therapist recommend that you do that or how did you, how did you figure that out? I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I had already, I had a friend who had referred me to the thought field therapist prior to my husband's death. So I had already been working with him on just childhood experiences. Cause I also think that when our, a grief from a loss like this can be compounded by grief of the past that's unhealed. Sure. So being able to go back and like heal some of those childhood experiences, um, really helped me face the grief that I had in front of me. And so, um, it took me a while to actually connect with the grief therapist that I still work with now. Um, I mostly did the thought field therapy at first. Um, but when I was like setting boundaries was such a big thing for me. Um, and so this grief therapist was really able to help one, give me words for what I was feeling so that I could try and actually explain it to other people. Yeah. He's, he's been very validating, um, because he specializes in this area, um, because it is so different and individualized. So often, right. I think when it comes to what we call quote negative emotions, so often it's, I find that the approach is like, get over it, just, just get over it, mm -hmm. you know, and having yeah. someone who understands, stands that. And, um, also like, I'm sure your listeners understand that and encourage mm -hmm. their clients, you know, like it's individualized and to work, mm -hmm. to work through it. Yeah. Oh gosh. Well, thanks for, thanks for kind of going, you know, taking us back a little bit to, you know, some of the stuff that you may have experienced when you were younger and how that played into what you were experiencing, you know, current day. That's, that's really helpful. And I, I think a lot of people who, um, who aren't therapists <laughs> who might be listening, you know, they don't pay attention to that so much because it's just not in there. That's not what's happening right now, but they might be reacting to something going on today because of something that happened to them in the past. And, you know, that's a lot of what we do in therapy. So, but I really liked what you said that I really latched onto was practice the habits when you're in a positive state. I think that's a really important skill to develop because like you, like, like you said, we were grasping for tools when we're feeling bad or when we're feeling the, the negative, but we'll just call them the negative feelings because they're uncomfortable and we don't like them a lot of times. Um, instead of kind of trying to grasp with those tools when we're feeling bad, we should practice those. I really think that's, I mean, a great way to look at it. And that reminds me of the book, um, Atomic Habits. Have you read that book by James Clear? I, so I, I have it on my shelf. I haven't read it okay. yet, but it's been recommended to me. So yeah. I'm, now, now I'm like, okay, that's the second person recently <laughs> to tell me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a really good book. And it kind of reminds me of what, what he shares, um, in his book. So are there, are there certain tools that you found to be like really helpful? Yeah. I, I just kind of latched on to whatever I could. So, <laughs> um, I am a big, f um, fan of journaling and I, in any way, my main thing is how can you express or get out the physical feelings we have surrounding our emotions in a healthy and supportive way? Mm -hmm. So if it's, I have sat in my car and screamed and cried and like been that crazy person, I have, um, gone to a boxing gym and like hit the bag. Uh, journaling has been one that's been pretty consistent. As I mentioned, therapy is always helpful just to get that, um, an outside perspective and kind of gain some clarity with that. 
Um, I've done massage therapy. I have, um, I just had, I was like, what's the other one? Oh yeah. Exercise. Um, you know, just even walking, Mm -hmm. walking on my treadmill has been really helpful or outside and being in nature and connecting with nature is, is also really good. So, and I know when I say this, it makes it sound like I'm engaging in these for like huge amounts of time. It's not like that. Like this is something I'm constantly working on is that self-care and how to fit it into my life because I am a single mom. But I will say that like even that five minutes and I know, I know when I don't have that, how it starts to impact me. And as soon as I tap into one of my tools, I'm like, oh, there it is. Like now, now, now I can continue to move forward. Sure. Sure. And so you said your son is three and a half. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So you were pregnant? When? Um, he was just over one actually. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. I'll get my math all mixed up. Okay. So he was, <laughs> he was, he was a baby. And, um, so how do you explain to your son where his daddy is? Yeah. So I, for right now, I try to make sure my language is as age appropriate as possible, but from the beginning, um, I have used the words that daddy is in heaven. Um, I do tell him like daddy lives in your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, And so when people will ask me, do you have pictures up? It took me a while to have pictures up um, just because it would cause a huge grief outburst for me, grief burst, grief reaction for me. Um, But uh, I'm, I'm pretty open. He's around other people and family members who talk about his dad. Um, We visit even um, family members from his dad's side of the family who still talk about him. Um, He's, he's like a miniature of his dad. So Um, just the way he thinks and the way he looks is just like my late husband. So, which I think is really cool. Um, but I'm a big fan of being open, but again, using age appropriate language for him. And I do appreciate that right now, like where he goes to school, um, that families look different. And so there's not as much attention on it right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do know that eventually I'm going to have to share a little bit more and have to go down that road of, of finding the way to, to try. I think something that I've read and, and learned from other people is how to separate that, um, his dad's decision, um, was separate of, of him, which sure. I think is really hard to, to tell a child. Right. Right. Yeah. I can imagine. And, and it it's, you'll, you know, I can only, I can only guess you'll figure it out as you, as you go along, you know, there's no predicting, I guess what, what, how that's going to, how that's going to play out. But it does sound like you have, you have the the skills and the knowledge as to, you know, you're aware, I guess is the important thing. You're very aware. Yeah. Thanks. And I did, I did forget to mention one of my biggest tools has been connecting with other people who've uh, who are grieving through the same type of loss. So I have a support group that I go to and all, all of the people in the support group have lost a loved one by suicide Um, And I also have some mom friends whose kids are older. And so I like, I have them as a resource as well, Mm -hmm. because I think that's a big one too. This whole process and grief in general can be very isolating. And I have to remind myself that it takes a village. It absolutely takes a, like, I cannot do this on my own. Sure. Like whether the grieving process or raising my son, like I can't do it on my own and to have resources is, and to, to be able to ask for help is huge. Yeah. So um, I know that by a little bit about you. And I'm wondering is one of the ways that you, um, help yourself is by helping others. Um, cause you know, you wrote the book and it sounds like that was part of your wanting to support other people going through it. And then you also work one-on-one with people too. Is that right? Yeah. So that's, that's more at the beginning stages, but that is, um, it is growing. And the idea really what I am looking at more is, as I mentioned earlier, is how can we, just in general as people work through the hurts we had as kids that we've carried on to in our adulthood that kind of keep us stuck. Mm. And so I think that's a big one um, that's come about for me. And so I want to be able to help other people, whether it's through grief um, by a loss like this, or just grief or feeling stuck in life of, of going, we, we tend to look at life as this linear, nice little wrapped package. And we're, this is what a successful life looks like. But in, but instead, you know, we want that predictability. And when it doesn't go that way, um, I'm finding that we tend as individuals to internalize that something must be wrong with us. Mm-hmm. Not this picturesque life that we've been told is what we're supposed to do, but something must be wrong with us. And I, um, when we shift that mindset to like, 
our reaction and how we respond, maybe more respond than react to situations is what's what can be predictable, but life isn't going to be. And so that's where that coaching comes in is just helping people really clean out from like, um, being an occupational therapist, I like doing things in a multi-sensory approach. And so that's kind of where that coaching comes in. Very cool. Yeah. It sounds like you can take a, you know, a, a, a medley of your skills and then what you're passionate about and interested in and firsthand experience, you know, in, in something like this is definitely a bonus. And unfor- unfortunately, I mean, I know that's, that sounds kind of weird, but you are going to help so many people by sharing your story and, you know, giving them these tools as well. So tell us um, a little bit about your book. Sure. Yeah. So um, it is available on Amazon Mm -hmm. and also I think um, barnesandnoble.com. Amazon tends to be where most people, (laughs) most people go. Um, And essentially it's, it walks through what I consider three phases of my healing process. So that first phase is going to be kind of that shock when, when you're going through it and it's just numbing and um, obviously the brain and body are going to try and protect us as much as possible. And when that shock lifts is different for every person, but at that point you're just, it's straight up survival. Mm -hmm. And then the second phase of that is kind of the now what? So when the, and for me, my, my, when my shock lifted, it was like palpable. I just, I remember exactly what happened and I was in my living room and I looked at my front door and went, oh, he is not coming through the front door and I need to figure out now, like, what are my next steps? And so the, the now what is, is kind of bridging that gap between your grieving and you've got this tumultuous emotional journey in front of you. And at the same time, you've got business in life that is continuing to move forward. And so how do you bridge that gap between the two? How can you start going to work, but yet still embrace and honor the emotional journey that you're on? Um, And then kind of work through, especially with this type of death. That was the time where I started really trying to pull apart, like setting boundaries, started pulling apart all the questions I had in regards to his death. What did I contribute to this situation? Um, And then the, the last phase I say kind of comes around in that tends to be more with like a little bit of that acceptance coming in and and that's called finding the collateral beauty. And that's where we start to recognize that we can still find joy in this life. There are, we can still plan for things. It doesn't dishonor our loved one and it is our way of moving forward. And essentially you're with a grief journey you're, you're going to have days that are going to trigger you and you're going to have days that are harder, but the goal is that the good days outweigh those days. And when they do, then you can really start putting one foot in front of the other and, and seeing that there is still a sense of purpose left here. Yeah. Well, I think you, you're, what you're doing now is, is just amazing and helping so many people, you know, who, and I'm hopeful that therapists listening will buy your book, read it, and then suggest it to their clients. It sounds like it's a beautiful memoir of, you know, what you, your husband, and then also the, what you've been through and then, you know, how you found yourself on the other side of it and just giving back to your community and the, and the people who really, who really need to hear your voice, you know, and to know that there is hope. So I'm excited to check it out in the show notes. We'll put the links to the book and and how to connect with you. We'll put your website. So when you think about the future, what, what are you looking forward to or most excited about? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't get that very (laughs) often. (laughs) Well, I, one of the things I do look forward to is seeing my son grow and him hitting his milestones um, of all different varieties. And it's just fun to see his personality come out and to see what parts are his dad, what parts are me. Mm -hmm. For me on a personal nature. Um, I'm just looking forward to opportunities like this, being able to have conversation and empower other people to start having the conversation and suicide is really hard. Death is really hard. And if we can almost, again, when I say normalize, that's usually the word I use, but that doesn't mean I condone. Um, and so I like to make that distinction, but when we can take the stigma away or that we can't talk about it or the censorship, that's where we bottle up more of those emotions or how we feel about it. And it's usually out of fear, right? We want to separate ourselves from horrible events and think that they could never happen to us. Yeah. But I I really, I look forward to, to being able to really empower people to be able to have these conversations and to really become more aware of what 
what are true priorities for them and to step into their own purpose for, for why they're here. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you came onto the show. It's been great to get to know you and and to have you. So thanks so much for being here. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank Thank you. you.